All right, we promised you a world champion. We brought you one from Impact Wrestling. Steve Macklin is joining us. And listen, Steve, thank you so much. I got to meet you a few times uh, bumming around with P.D. Williams. And I believe it was natural was when I first met you. And uh, you couldn't have been a nicer guy to me. So thank you very much. No, oh, I appreciate it. Anybody in the back. That was like one of the first rules. Well, just in general in life, being a nice person. But that was one of the first rules in the business. You never know who you're going to meet behind the scenes. You know, never know who it is to so always say hello and be respectful. That's kind of just it. So. All right. Well, listen, uh, I'm jumping in with a uh, question right off the bat. This is going to feel like some sort of a congressional hearing on your part. So uh, sit back, relax and enjoy this. But uh, as a fan of impact wrestling and following the storyline with you and Josh Alexander, he gets hurt and then they have to make a U-turn. You still end up winning the world championship. Is there a part of you as a performer that feels like maybe this run isn't going to be as great as it is because you didn't win it from a Josh Alexander? Uh, no circumstances, obviously with Josh being injured, it, it sucks. That's the business things happen and you just keep moving on and you find a different way to get to where we're going. But in the storyline as well, people forget that Josh was wrestling Kushida at the multiverse. So it could have been either one coming out of that match and it could have been Kushida and I all along the rebellion and people don't uh, re seem to realize that too. But uh, do I wish it was Josh and to beat the longest reigning impact world champion in history and especially in his hometown of Toronto? Yes, I would have loved that because then I could just throw that in everybody's face even more. Uh, but I'm still the impact world champion. That, that's it. And for as long as I hold on to this title, I'm going to wait until Josh is healthy uh, to have that matchup. And I think that's the matchup everybody's waiting for. Well, in today's current climate where, you know, we're having longer lasting champions, it seems like. I feel like a lot, you know, when you think about the Attitude Era, I mean, that belt was switching like every five minutes, right? And and now with, and especially with Impact, because those, the storylines are long and they're drawn out. And if you look hard enough, you can see how everything plays into mm -hmm. what's currently happening. So when you have these storylines that are sort of, you know, stretched out and you have to make that quick U-turn, do you did, do you feel like it's easy to adapt as opposed to, you know, you know, uh, just waiting for those things to, to play out, if that makes sense? No, it does. It's like from looking on the outside and then looking to in, it's as a fan, you're just like, oh, this is probably how they're going. And then sometimes a curveball's thrown there and it actually ha helps the story in the long run. Uh, I feel, and especially with what the injury and everything happening, I thought the relinquishment of the title ceremony came off perfect, perfect for that segment, especially with Scott there having Jet and Jen in the ring. Just all the emotions were put into one, and it made for a better segment to then eventually go down the road and tell that story. Uh, so now that's a different layer we can go to, which is always the best part about wrestling. The more layers you have to something, whether it's a character or a storyline, the better. You, you know, uh, I would say if people look at your career right now and they go, okay, impact champ, but they don't really know where you came from. And uh, being a fan of yours, I went back and had to do a little bit more study and to figure out, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed like you had a short run on the indies before going to WWE. And then whatever happened there, you, you moved on. At the end of that tenure, going into this new chapter, was there a little bit of being intimidated because you didn't run the roads like the average indie guy did? You were, you know, you were brought up, and I know everybody knows nothing lasts forever, but you you go into this whole new world from the WWE system to indie wrestling and appearances and bookers. Was there anybody you leaned on for advice on how to navigate those waters? My wife, my wife, hands down, has been the best because she made a name for herself on the independence before she was even signed with her time with WWE and then being let go and then getting the impact. But uh, she has been my backbone through all of this. And I know they have the old cliche segment behind every uh, great man is a great woman. She's standing right there next to me. So she's she's carried me along in that process and got me adapted to it pretty quickly. And I enjoy it too. Cause even when we're on the road together, she can tell I enjoy the independence because it's just fun. I love live crowds. I've TV wrestled for so long. That's what WWE is just, it's TV wrestling. You learned how to be an entertainment company and the live events are where you get to have those fun. Uh, but obviously with NXT, we don't have those and the opportunities sometimes weren't there uh, to go out and enjoy. So I make, take full advantage of the live events, especially with the independence trying new things on my end and then going to some brewery or some little warehouse that they have set up. Like I just did a show on Boca Raton 
uh, last night. We got home around 3.30, and I was like, this is great. I flew in from Iowa on Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, picked her up. We got on the road. We both wrestled, and we came back home. And that's I, that's the business to me is is I love wrestling. I love traveling. And again, though, she hands down is what is what helped me. You know, follow up question to that. And uh, did you feel like uh, you were still too new in the industry to let being released by WWE bother you? Because it felt like you were there. You were very successful. And then you wasn't for the circumstances. Was it like, all right, you know what? Uh, I was there for, you know, a short amount of time. I didn't get too comfortable. Uh, I'm going to be successful here as where if you were there for 10 years, some of those guys kind of don't seem to find their footing on the indie scenes. Sometimes, but that's also, I think when you come out of WWE, what were you doing then? And what can you do different from how you were perceived by that fan base and wherever you're going elsewhere, like reinventing yourself and, me, I just had ideas that I built up that I wanted to do for so long. I'm like, okay, how do I present this to the people of who I am and what I've been wanting to do for so long and get the opportunity to? And luckily with Impact, that's the one thing is the opportunity given to me for that. Well, just in case some of our listeners don't know who your wife is, it's it's yeah. the very talented Deanna Perrazzo, um, and who's 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 a champion herself, you know, and she's been, you know, part of the Impact. Uh, she's been an impact champion a few times now, I think. So, you know, being married to a professional wrestler and also then being in the same company, like you said, that there's a bond there, obviously, that, you know, only those who have experienced it would understand that. And you said that she's your backbone and she's your rock. So does that mean that you actually go to her for her experience as far as, you know, in the sense of like, a, um, uh what to do maybe in matches like how to tell stories like do you guys bounce off ideas because obviously the evolution of your character <clears throat> as 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 time moves on we're seeing a broader broader macklin right so do you do you guys bounce off ideas about where to take your characters we do this house is 24 7 wrestling uh wrestling's about to be on here at eight o'clock on the tv in the living room and it's just constantly always on or constantly throw at each other ideas. And that's the thing in wrestling too. It's very hard to find people that are honest and trustful uh, towards who you are. Like it's getting in the car with a bunch of the guys. I'm sure you did it on the road when you guys had show uh, running shows. You're like, oh, wow, the crowd sounded cool here that I, oh, this, like, maybe this set worked. And you just kind of get those fine tunes. And that's what it is going to people that you can trust. And having her, I have some of my best friends from my time in WWE, my former tag partner, Blake. Uh, there's just people you can go to. And those are the people you want to be able to be, honest and that's the hardest thing is getting truthful honesty i don't know what i i don't want to really know what i did well i want to know what i did bad what looked what looked bad what could have been better and then that's why we go to each other and that's one of those things we both work on like she every every week she's got something new for gear she's like how would this be for this set or how would i look elegantly like this and be different and that's the one thing she's been killing it at is just always being different and adapting and turning her game up and that's where we have fun bouncing ideas well, I really want, we really want to get her on this show. So if you could do us a favor and say, hey, do the show, that would be sick. I could have her poke her head in here right now. <laughs> well, that's the only reason why we had you on. Is yeah, exactly. Oh, you're to yeah, you just to her. trying cool. to get, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, yeah, uh, thanks. No, but in, in all honesty, like, you know, we, we, we've asked for her. I know that there was a scheduling thing at one point, but my point is, is I guess that, um, you know, to have that is such it's such a beautiful thing you know what i mean and um uh i digress you you're a proud military man and in the background if you're not watching the video you have a captain america comic book hanging up behind you now yeah. it, is there a version of you out there somewhere that really wants to uh, at some point wear the red white and blue be a face be pro are you like so in love with being a hill that maybe that's not even something you want to do the greatest baby faces are once great heels. That's my, my take on it. Uh, I, I put that in the work ethic and what you do. Um, do I want to do the red, white, and blue flag waving? If it fits at the moment, but do I want to No. the way I kind of perceive my character and what I always try to stay away from, even with my time in NXT and pitching ideas of being a Marine is like, that's just not like who is me other than just being a Marine. That's just a part of me. So how can I tweak that and give a vision of it that's not Hulk Hogan or Sergeant Slaughter or Hacksaw right. Jim Duggan that hasn't been seen on TV that's more realistic? How can I appeal to a veteran crowd that or like people that could actually tune into it? Holy shit, that's me. Like I can get with that. And
and that's where I kind of take from Captain America a little bit, especially his nomad in the comics when he goes rogue. And then a lot of Punisher stuff, especially with John Brententhal in his last Punisher. That's where I'm like, holy shit, like, this is me on television. Please, I want to steal from this and, like, make it my own. Well, I see you more as a Bucky, just more of a little bit more of an asshole. You know what I mean? So, I, and I and I thank the Lord all day that you're not a Captain America gimmick because I think that would ruin everything. So, um, for me anyways, because one of the things I wanted to ask you is there was a time here, and it's before you got the belt, and I felt like you, you it was there was like this minute where you just kind of came into your own. And I don't know if it was like something that, the company felt at the same time, but it, as the viewer, and I think, you know, a lot of people felt this way, you kind of, you know, all of a sudden it felt like you had arrived. And then, uh, you know, a month later or so, two months later, you had the belt. Now, were you feeling something like, w was there a point for you where you're like, I'm, I'm kind of long overdue for this shot or, uh, you know, do, does it feel like the right time? Felt like the right time. I love that I didn't just come in and win the title. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't like that creatively. I was allowed to, and it was good with Robert Evans and Jimmy in the background, who are two head writers, and then even Scott, like just bouncing ideas off of them, playing the long game, and get people invested in who I am instead of just here you go, here's a title. Right. Like, me and Trey have me and Trey for the X Division title at Hard to Kill two years ago. Like the build up into that, that was like one of those first stories I can sink my teeth into and kind of let people into who I was with promos and the backstage segments. And then just keep building it for a full year of just beating former Impact World Champions. And then here, granted, I am being the bad, I am the bad guy, but I'm also being honest of what I'm doing. I'm beating every former world champion. I'm not getting a shot. Why? I'm asking the question of why. And people took it as whining. It's like, no, I'm just being honest in my own right. You may not agree with what I'm doing, but that's just me. And that's where I'm trying to stick to is who I am and never let anything change who I am and just still play to the storyline that we can. Yeah, well, so I just wanted to reiterate something and see if you also agree on something, because it, it, that that timing I'm talking about, it's like I could now visualize you in this World Heavyweight Championship picture, right? So, and you, like you said, you bit, you know, when, when you and Trey were, were going at it, whatever, you did this whole thing. Was this the logical next step or was it like, you know, sometimes guys have to win tag belts or whatever it is? Did you... uh? Is it was it something for you that was always like, I need to be in this in this in this arena and and be mentioned with these names? You set out to be a, for, a world champion in this business. I don't, if you're not in it to win world titles or just any title in general, that's that's our job. You should be wanting to be the champion, and that's what I was striving for when I stepped into Impact Wrestling. Uh, right after Trey and I, I, with the whole X division run that I got to have, I got to show people that I can adapt to everyone and work with any style. And that's the best part about the X division is it allows people to see, okay, this guy can do this. This guy can do this. So he maybe can't do this, but he can adapt to it a little bit. And that's the fun with it. And, uh, that's what I got out of the X division. It allowed people to see who I am and my work rate and what I can do, especially with a lot of the talent that impact has. Uh, that's just Trey's awesome that everybody, the X division has always been awesome. Um, with Chris Saban, Shelly, just oh, everybody, man. so long, Frankie, even when he was there, Joe and AJ. Like, Joe was one of those other guys that I tried to base it off of going back and watching him in the X Division matches where it's just like, okay, here comes a big brute guy. How is he adapting to this? He's just being a powerhouse. And that's where the contrast of style is making the X Division even better. Like, high-flying match, if it's a high-flyer versus a high-flyer is great, but if I'd rather watch the other. You can see that so many times. I'd rather watch a good long story out of movement and – that's just me. Yeah. You, you've had a very interesting ride in this wrestling business. And uh, in the grand scheme of things, what, 2014 was kind of when you started to now uh, in a lot of in being world champion, a lot of wrestlers career, there are 20 years before they even sniff the kind of gold that you have. At what moment did you realize, I think I'm going to make it in the industry? <laughs> I think after a few years of not getting fired in NXT, uh, <laughs> my time there, I was like, okay, I'm on to something I'm doing right, but I got put into that hold of like, I can make people look good, but we need to some see something out of you that we haven't seen yet and waiting for my time in the movie, uh, which never really came. We got called up and everything, but things happened during COVID and you can't do anything about it. But when I knew I wanted, I just put everything against on my, on my shoulders the day I was let go. And I said, all right, here, I'm getting my vignettes done. I'm getting my character. I want to show everybody who I am. And then when I did step foot to Impact, 
I looked around and a few matches, a few weeks went by. It was okay, cool. I, I think I can be a guy here just by looking at the locker room. A lot of guys I work with beforehand that are even at an impact was great too. And then it was actually me and Josh backstage talking, Alexander, and uh, we just both kind of looked at each other like, oh, we need to meet one day in the ring. So it's one of those things where it, it, it all fit and just works. And that's what's good with impact is there's so many different characters and styles that you can just adapt into a situation and take advantage of it. And I'm grateful for my time in WWE because that's what taught me to work television wrestling. So I get to come to impact with that experience where you got a lot of guys in impact that haven't really had TV experience, mostly coming from the independence or not never, ever working TV. And that's where they're learning. Well, I guess my next question is kind of a two-parter. You remind me a lot that with psychology and just some of your movements of Steve Regal or William Regal, I should say. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that like there was, um, you know, some connection there, obviously with the NXT. Um, but secondly, I guess, you know, the psychology in wrestling, I feel like is, is sort of been lost in a lot of ways. I see that you're one of the ones that kind of keep it there and can tell the story in the ring. And I understand that there needs to be a broad, you know, scope of what wrestling is because obviously it's progressed and, you know, some, you just have your high spot matches or whatever it may be, but mm -hmm. The style of wrestler that you are, it seems like you're you're kind of more of a, a psychological one. Do you think that comes from your training in NXT? It just comes from my time, even starting at the Monster Factory when I got my start in 2012. Like that was just instilled in me. It was like stick to the story, stick to the basics. That's what gets people inv invested and involved. And Danny Cage, Blue Meanie, Bill Wiles, uh, just um, – uh, Punishment Martinez, um, Damian Priest was there at the time, QT Marshall. Those are guys that kind of taught me along the run there. And then when I got signed, that was just, of, of course, WWE is preaching storytelling, 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 character, character, character. And then being able to learn from Dusty Rhodes for promos, and being able to find my voice with him. And he kind of helps me get along to still stay me and find like that tuning has always been there. And that's also some of the things that I have fun with taking advantage of now in independence is I get to go tell the stories, but then I also get to have some fun where it's not so much uh, storytelling where we just go out and do crazy stuff because then I get to try things there. But um, again, adaptability. But I always I always relate everything to psychology because I think that's what creates longevity in careers nowadays, too. So many people nowadays are multi time champions and they have 15, 20 year career or year careers now. And that's one of those things you didn't see back in the day from the 80s and 90s. Everybody now is still sticking around. And that's one good thing, I think. Uh, that's good for the psychology is it's making the matches easier on our bodies where we can go and show out on a pay-per-view, but let the TV tell the story. Now, uh, as far as I know myself or Lars, maybe I'm wrong here. I've never been world champions in a wrestling promotion. So I don't know if this is a thing that other world champions do, but now that you're a world champion, do you compare yourself to other champions on other TV shows what you can do, maybe like a own rankings list in your head and how you can move up and down it? No. Uh, the best thing for it is the CD Impact ratings continue to go up. That's what I worry about is with Impact Wrestling. Comparing myself to others, there's really no point. That's up to the fans. That's for the fans. They can do that. Uh, I appreciate wherever they do rank me or anybody does rank me, but I just try to go out there and treat every match as if it's my last and give it my all. Uh, and being the world champion, that just lets me – be the face that I feel that should be the head of the company and the way I want to represent it as well is what I try to do. Well, you know, you, you know, impact is obviously growing and I want to talk a little bit about Trinity here because that's a big fucking signing. Right. Yes. And that has elevated the company and put the company in a lot of people's eyes that may not have crossed. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know that the, the backstage, the camaraderie, it's like an all for one kind of situation. I've been in the back at some of the shows and it feels like, like a team, right? So um, are you seeing things, cause you just sort of, you know, alluded to it a little bit. Do you, are you seeing things kind of starting to kind of bubble up and get bigger than impact? Yes, uh, bigger I, think for impact excuse me? I think for the past two years that I've been there, it's been the quiet bubble that's constantly just been growing. And then that kind of finally just popped recently. We've had the past five pay-per-views and television sold out. Right. So that's it's just it's just getting better. And, and granted, we are in the smaller venues, but we're selling those smaller venues out and the houses look great. The crowd is it just energetic and into the storytelling. And then with Trinity showing up in Chicago was really cool just for my behalf, too, because like I was in her shoes where 
she I even had the conversation with her. I was like, how you doing? She's like, it's just weird for me to be told to just go be you. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> Tell me about like. And it's just it's one of those things that you just don't know. I was like, just go and be. And I even said that to her. I was like, just own it and go be you. Show the world who you are. And that's what happened when I got to impact was I got to go show the world who I was. And I think I've done that in the past two years, uh, being able to do what I have done with the opportunity given. Steve, uh, maybe that's easy said than done, but how do you go out and do that when you're, and this is a serious question, but when you're under the regime of WWE where you are kind of told what to do and you go do it, and even in the military where you're given an order, you go do it, and then you come to a place and they're like, yeah, just go do it. I don't know, figure it out out in the ring. Is that like a mind fuck for you coming from, you know, these other situations? We're not allowed to just go rogue and just go out there and do whatever. Like, <laughs> right. Producers, I would like it's not like that, but uh, we do. We're given the leeway to go show. If obviously, if you mess up, you're not going to do it again, or you're going to be told, "Hey, don't do that again," or that didn't work. But um, it's just at first it was, and it was weird too to debut as well without a crowd because now I had nobody to feed off of. I'm trying a new character, and then once people came back, that's where I kind of started building my confidence more, just because you get to feed off the crowd, and that's something that. I enjoyed because I get to show them who I am and I'm getting my character out there while also being helped by creative kind of honing into a storyline or where they see me as well. And we work together. Do you have the heavyweight belt in your house right now? Yeah. Why wouldn't I? I'm just asking why you didn't show up wearing it. That's my question. Why wouldn't you show up here wearing that fucker? Just like draped over the shoulder, cigar, something. You know, I'm just don't need the belt. To, don't need the belt for you to know that I'm the champ. Everybody yeah, go. Good. That's good. Next question. Next question. Holy shit. Oh, well, champ. Listen, uh, I'm sorry we didn't respect you on that one, buddy. Uh, <laughs> that was a Lars thing. Uh, he didn't clear with me. Uh, just to be clear, Dennis fed me that. So yeah. that was like, I got a great question for you, Lars. Why don't you ask me <laughs> this? Uh, no worries. <laughs> can, can we just talk about how you found out about it? Because this is kind of yeah. a Pete Williams question of, and back when he was on the podcast, he loved to ask guys, you know, when did you when did you find out that you were going to get the belt? How? Uh, I kind of knew about a month before that I was going over, and then I, I always just go into things in wrestling. It's just things always change, and I try to keep a clear head of not getting my hopes up, so I'm not disappointed. Uh, so I always keep my standards pretty low and everything. And that's one thing I learned in the Marine Corps is keep your standards pretty low because you're going to be disappointed at some point. So it's just, I'll worry about it when I get out there. Is it cool to know ahead of time of where we're going for the story? Because originally I was supposed to go towards the title at Bound for Glory, win in the call your shot, but then Bully came in, changed it, and it actually helped me in the long run with the storyline as well because then it went to Bully and Josh, built Josh up even more, and then it was building even more for me and Josh. Where we knew it was going to be Josh and I at Rebellion, it's just how are we going to get there? And uh, obviously plans changed, but uh, being told that I was going to win was awesome. And then even for my wife to then win the title on the same night made it even cooler because we never imagined that to happen. We did expect to be champions at some point together, but never on the same night, both winning. And especially her main eventing with Jordan, they killed it. I was so happy for her, so proud of her. You know, we've been talking about that sort of, you know, being told what to do, then going to execute, then you get into a place where obviously creative freedom, you know, there's a lot more of it, right? Um, and you, now your experience, since you've experienced both, you know, sort of like clocking in, clocking out in a way, in a way, um, and now that you have this creative freedom, and, and I think that's probably why your character, you know, your time has come, it's because you were able to do that. How important now do you feel that creative control is in the world of professional wrestling, or at least, uh, at least having some say about your creative, uh, about where you're going or what your character is. In impact wrestling is what I can speak for. I enjoy it. I love it. It's what makes me love impact is I go to work and I just get to do me and mm. I get to be me. And that's the cool part. And I had this conversation yesterday at one of the shows talking in a meet and greet to a fan where he was telling me, oh, I was wrong with WWE. Did you? I'm like, listen, what I learned from WWE is that it's a business. That was the company that I loved as a child, my dream. And did it break my heart when I was like, oh, yes. But was it a learning lesson? Because I for, was there for seven, seven, almost seven and a half years uh, for my time there. And it was just a learning lesson to know that this is just a business, wasn't my part of the movie. I just didn't fit. Now it's time to go and show who I am. And that's exactly what I've done in Impact Wrestling. 
Well, now that you've had this experience, right, where you're you're able to kind of express yourself the way that you want to do, build your character, do you ever feel like you could ever go back into a situation where it would be more of a clock in, clock out kind of thing? Again, depends on the situation and where I'm at. Um, maybe, I don't know. I, I wouldn't mind, but I would also know how to speak up now, more or less, uh, mm. when I can speak up too. Because I now that I go back to times, I'm like, oh, I should have spoken up here and said no to this, or in a in a, in a tactful way, without saying just outright, no, I'm not doing that. But uh, I don't know. We'll see. I just again, I'm enjoying my time and impact on the world champ. I'm on top of the game right now. Uh, I'm being recognized by everybody now, which is is what I wanted for a long time was people to know who I am and what I'm capable of, and that I am one of the best talents out there. And I'm trying to prove myself still to this day. When they put you on top of a company as a world champion, you have an opportunity to shape the company in the way you want as that champion. Have you really put any thought to how your reign as champion you would like to either elevate impact or change impact or just put your championship stamp on that product? Well, I get a lot of different matchups now. I got PCO coming up at Under Siege, so I got to face Frankenstein, which is a fun thing to do. And I just get to show a different level because you just had a, a year-long reign with Josh Alexander, and he showed out. He was the heart of this company. He proved to people whether they were cheering him at the beginning of the match, at the end of the match, they were always they were all or uh, booing him at the beginning of the match and rooting for the other person because they just put on great matches. You remember how whoever's in the ring with him. But at the end, he had the respect. And that's the only thing that I work for is the respect of my peers and the audience and just people to watch that tune in. And I, what's going to make people tune in more? And that's what I want to try to do is get more eyes on Impact Wrestling. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of ideas, right? I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is there something, is there a guy in the company right now that you feel like if you got in the ring with him, not the opponents that you're coming up against, but the guy maybe you haven't seen yet, or maybe seen once and you feel like you could elevate not only his career, but your career at the same time. Is there one guy in that company? I know there's probably a few for you, but who's the first guy that comes to mind? Still Josh, regardless, that's, that's the match I, I've wanted for a long time. Cause I, it's a proof to myself as well of beating a guy that just had the title for a year that had to vacate it because of injury. Cause he just, he busted his ass granted circumstances happen but uh what can you do but he's definitely the one uh i would love another shot at chris saban again you know I, it's all about elevating my game as well that's one of those things i still want to prove myself as well because chris saban's another one where we went one and one we didn't get to find out who was the better out of those two right. uh within the company at a young talent i would say probably a chris bay or an ace Austin would be mm -hmm. another one i think i know they're tag team champs right now but uh Maybe somewhere down the line, a feud with the Bullet Club would be kind of fun. We're in this new age of you could pop up anywhere at any moment. Uh, I think us as wrestling fans, as much as we geek out about it, it's still a new concept to all of us that even though we're a couple years into it, we're still wrapping our minds around it. Um, you representing Impact all around the world. Is there any opportunities that have been presented to you to pop up someplace as an impact champion that we may not expect you to? As of right now, no, but we got multiverse coming up uh, multiverse two for whom the bell tolls uh, up in uh, Philly in August, which I'm looking forward to. And I've been calling out Kenta. That's the man I want from Japan. I uh, would love to go to Japan myself. Um, I'd love to go to the UK, but again, it's a like you said, it's a different age of wrestling where anybody can pop up anywhere, and that's the fun part towards fans is, is keeps you on the edge of your seat. It also keeps us on the edge of our seat as talent, too, because things can just happen organically from one company to another. So I could get a phone call tomorrow and say I could show up at AEW or, um, hey, well, we got this idea in Mexico with AAA. And it's just it's crazy times. Uh, but right now, nothing uh, and nothing that I would actually give you any information on anyway if I was to. So Worth a try. <laughs> secret squirrel stuff <laughs> okay so this is something that i've been asking recently because um i'm not too sure how you feel about it every every wrestler has been a little bit different but when you're in a company do you and you maybe you were watching another wrestling program do you feel like it's weird to be tweeting or be doing social media and in praising another person in another company um, for doing a good job, maybe that you've enjoyed, uh, is it is it weird for you 
the thought of that or doing that? Uh, the thought of it, people can do whatever they want. That, that That's up to them how they want to be perceived on Twitter. I try to keep stick to my brand and who I am, promote myself on Twitter. Um, but I usually send a text if it's a good match of somebody that I watched. And that's usually, or I'll shoot a DM, not one to skylight it so it's out there. And it's just, oh, this person's saying, like, I I'm not into it. If everybody else does that, that's fine. That that's just not my cup of tea on that. But um, in the age of Twitter, that's the only way to promote right now. So we get our name more our names out there. That's how you and I have linked up as well. I think he's talking to you because he's has me blocked on Twitter. No, do I? No, no, you don't. No. <laughs> well, Ooh. you got to stop sending him unsolicited P videos. We've already talked about this. I'm sorry. He, I mix him up with the other <laughs> Macklin that does the P videos. <laughs> Same spelling. I'm sorry. He's got two C's in his name. And you know, when I get drunk, I leave out the C. So I totally apologize. <laughs> <laughs> anyways um let, let's talk about how you got started in the wrestling because uh you know i i love the journey were you a wrestling fan i mean you're a very athletic guy of course is it just something you're like i got muscles i'm big let's see how this works out diehard fan growing up i uh, grew up my mom and dad uh both worked different day shift the night shift so i never i we both lived in a three-family house with my grandparents and that's who introduced me to wrestling of old wrestling tapes because uh, they would get the VHSs of the pay-per-views from WCW and WWF at the time where they get them. And that's where we just sat and watched. And then every Saturday night we're watching WWE, uh, WWE. My grandmother was a Piper and Andre fan. I Sick. loved Piper growing up. And it was just one of those things where I'm like, what is this? And then Bret Hart came into my life and then Stone Cold came into my life, Shawn Michaels. And then it, it just, it just awesome as as a fan growing up and i loved it and i never grew up from it too and i was always considered a nerd for it uh, even for my friends and playing football and amateur wrestling i always tried to do pro wrestling just at some point i'm jumping off of some garage or the basketball hoops onto the track meets uh big blue padding just being mcfoley and it's just stupidity of being a fan but um yeah to answer that that's 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 me being a fanboy growing up but i, I got into it when i got out of the marine corps I found the monster factory in Paulsboro, New Jersey, and I got into the ring and I fell in love. And that was in May of 2012. And then I had my first match that November, which was a battle Royal. And then I was signed. Uh, I had my tryout with WWE NXT at the new performance center when it was built uh, that July of um, 2013 was signed in October as I was an extra on a loop. And then I showed up at the performance center in January of 2014 and was there until my tenure was up at uh, 2020. Okay. Paint a little bit of a picture here. You're in the Marine Corps. You get out. What are the prospects? Was, uh, was there any other aspirations that you had that like, if this wrestling thing wasn't going to work out, or was this something that, like, no, this is always what I'm going to do? So I uh, took the state police test in New Jersey uh, as I was going to I was going to college at Rowan University as well, taking advantage of the GI Bill while training. And then I took the police test statewide, went and took the state police test as well. The physical did all that. And then I was told no. So I was like, okay, cool. All my, ba all my eggs are in the basket right now for pro wrestling. This is where we're going. Uh, I was all in. I told Danny that. I'm like, what do I need to get, do to get the WWE or get to Japan? What do I need to do? And luckily enough, he brought in Joe Briscoe for a tryout and a seminar at the factory. And that was my uh, opening of the door to WWE was Joe Briscoe. And he got me. He said, just stay here. I was just starting to branch out on the independence as well and getting out there a little bit outside the monster factory. And once Briscoe said, don't go anywhere else, stay here, stick to the basics. I will get you a tryout. I said, yes, sir. Why would I listen to that, too? Because it's, it's Joe Briscoe. So I was like, all right, cool. This is simple. I come here. I just train. I train and work on matches. And that's what I did. And then luckily enough, I had my tryout. And I was a year and a half on the independence when I started. Very lucky, very blessed for that, too, uh, to have that experience. But then also, when I got to NXT, that was when they weren't hiring any into talent. And then it built into eventually what it became of that NXT bubble when Sammy, Kevin, Finn, Kent, like, uh, Kenta came in. And everybody, Bobby Roode. Adam Cole, just all the names started influxing. That's what burst that bubble. And then it was funny because you're working your way to get on TV. And then, then this new guy comes in. So you come back down. 
And that's just the the name of the game too. And you learn that and that's the experiences there. Uh, so from 2014 to 2020. Being, being former military, did you ever get the opportunity to go do one of the tribute for the troop shows or, or go on a base to a signing like that? And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I see the look in your face. Yeah, I, so I we I pitched so many ideas for tribute every year. I just was sending it to creative, but sometimes it didn't go through. And even for Blake and I to get back on TV at one point, I was pitching have us redebut at tribute to the troops would be awesome. No. Uh, just one of those ideas you throw out. It's just, it's not for you at the time, but uh, I did have the privilege of going for three years straight. Uh, I went to San Diego, the one here in Jacksonville when uh, Mania was here in Florida and then out in um, Arizona. Oh, I forgot where the other one was. There was one at Camp Lejeune as well. Uh, that we got to actually go back to my old base, which is kind of cool to do. Oh. Um, so that was really cool. I, we didn't get, we went to uh, where uh, School of Infantry was at Camp Geiger and then we went to the poke side of it, which is opposite of infantry. I was infantry. We went to the poke side, personnel other than grunts. I don't know, for the lingo on that one. But got to go that. Everybody's like, oh, was this how the chow hall was for you? I was like, no, I never got to go to chow hall. I was out in the field uh, training. Uh, so, yeah, that was one of those things. But it was awesome to have those moments and be able to – I got a bunch of challenge coins as well. Uh, if you can see, that's what this is up here. Uh, I got one from an EOD here. Uh, in San Diego, they gave it out to me for explosive ordnance disposal. We got to hang out with the bomb squads and play with the all their gadgets and stuff. But yeah, overall, it was cool experiences. Do I wish I got to wrestle in front of a, a, a crowd like that? Yes, but uh, whatever. Maybe one day. Well, okay. So I do know a little bit about the Marine Corps because the 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 man who pretty much raised me was a a Marine drill sergeant. Okay, so um, I definitely was afraid of him. Like deathly afraid but also loved him with all my heart you were talking about the jargon right so you kind of went from one place the marine corps which has its own speak to wrestling which also has its own speak um is it ironic to you that these are the professions that you've chosen yeah i ran around as a little kid fake wrestling with my buddies and beating each other up and then running around with toy guns and grenades and playing war so it's like i get to just be my child itself uh which is great <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't sing, so I couldn't become a rock star, which I <laughs> wanted to do when I was little. Well, you know what? We went at, we actually, Rancid visited Camp, Camp Lejeune, uh, Lejeune uh, a lot of the injured guys there, because uh, we got a lot of requests. So when we went out there, we were able to go onto the base. And I think we were one of the first bands to actually do that, um, because oh. there, was a, there was a lot of requests to visit a lot of those guys. Uh, mostly they were injured, um, but really good people, you know what I mean? So, and thank you for your service. With that, I'm out. Thank you. You, you know, uh, I'm going to wrap this podcast up with kind of a Lars question. Well, I got, I got oh. one more question for him, but so we're not wrapping up until I get my question. So. Okay. Well, First. then I'm going to ask this, and this is kind of something Lars is, you know, asked off it, and on throughout different part podcasts. But you listen, you're a military guy. You know, you can go into the ring and for the most part, just destroy someone if you want to. You have that training. <laughs> How hard was it maybe at first or even now is it sometimes to kind of keep that maybe checked aggression uh, to a I'm in the ring. I really don't need to break this guy's fingers right now. You learn how to work. And that's the one thing I learned at the beginning was learn how to work. If you make somebody look good, you're going to have a job for life. If you can bump and feed and make everybody look good, you're going to have a job for life is what I was told. That was my first goal, learning how to be like, okay, cool. How do I learn the basics, sell right, and look good for people? And then eventually it'll pay it back to myself, and that's how you learn. You get to work with more people that are experienced than you. Uh, and then learning how to work light is when I got to the PC. Like, when I first started, I was probably – I was probably – I shouldn't say probably. I was pretty stiff uh, just because you don't know. You're learning how to work, and it's just you're trying to control yourself. And that's where the Performance Center came in and working with Nick Dinsmore and – working around with Terry Taylor. Like those are the experiences I got to like, Oh, okay. This is how it is moving around. And this is a lot easier learning how to hone in that aggression. But then that's also one of those things to my advantage too, is where I try to tell people is like, don't forget what I did for a living before this. <laughs> like, technically, I shouldn't say for a living, but like, don't forget what I was, I was capable of doing then. And now I yes. have to dial that back as I get into it. Right? And I think that's also one of those fun things too for me is where I get to actually have my own outer body experience when I do wrestle, where I get to let out that aggression, but have to hold it back and put on the theatrics to make everything that I look do mean something, look as real as possible. 
and suspend that disbelief. Okay. Now, for my final question, the first part of it is, is, is Deanna in earshot? Ah, uh, I can get her here. You day. No. Oh, well, here she Dang. comes now. Okay. Come here real quick. She's doing homework. Oh, what? Oh, she's doing homework. Yeah, she's uh, doing her uh, her final. This is her final paper. Uh, she gets oh. to graduate this uh, July. Gotcha. Wait That's another question. Ours. You you ruined it. She's they want to do an ear. They want to do an ear shot. Well, she can get it. You know what, Deanna? Can you, would you please come into frame, please? Because I have a question. Uh, uh, I you look. You, oh. Why would I? Hi. Hi. How's it going? Sorry to interrupt your homework. That's so okay. My, my final question, because you know we've obviously uh, you know interviewed a lot of uh, professional wrestlers uh, who have been married to each other. So my question for for you, Macklin, is this. You and Deanna, uh, you, you got to wrestle. First of all, what's the stipulation? What kind of match is it? Who's going over? And what's the finish? Uh, my wife's going over with her pile driver uh, or Fujiwara, but I probably won't tap, so I'll probably pass out for that. Oh, okay. Uh, wow, way not to pull oh, over, Macklin. Yeah, way to go, Macklin. <laughs> I'll take the pin. I won't submit. That's fair. All um, right. No, oh. it's the ring light. Oh, <laughs> what kind of glowing for us? Well, what uh, I would say a straight up. Uh, I would. I would love to do if anything a submission match, something technical. Because you're a lot match. better at technical wrestling. Okay. So probably a submission match would be the stipulation. But I'm not tapping. I'm passing out. Okay. So is it? Are we? Is it a loser leaves town? Is it a? Is it a hair versus hair? Is it a? What is it? I think it's an Iron Man match. Whoa! One hour Iron okay. Man match. Okay. 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 I one like pinfall, though. One pinfall. One pinfall. It. So it's a one fall match. Okay. Deanna's going over. It's an Iron Man match. Okay. And uh, so let me ask this: um, Who's leading the match? <laughs> I'll let her call it from one hundred percent. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a control freak. <laughs> yeah, it would be a lot easier that way. Well, I appreciate I, we appreciate you popping in and answer help helping us answer this question because I figured Absolutely. we were gonna get we were gonna get the honest answer out of Steve if you were involved. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And any chance we get to see you both as like a stable now that you're the the what first husband and wife champions in Impact? Do we do you guys become a stable like the king and queen of Impact? Wow, we've been told no. Yeah, uh, we don't That's exist in the Impact world right now, so. Oh, we're gonna, have to, <laughs> we're gonna have to talk to somebody. Who do we got to get on this podcast? You know, the more. Oh, Scott's the more. more you enough. know what? It could work though. Scott's been a pain in my ass for a long time. I'd like to hit him <laughs> sometimes too. Talk about the best feel in the world of winning the world title to get. We both won the world title the same night, and I got to hit the boss. Dream. And I got no repercussions for it. It's the best <laughs> thing in the world. I mean, it's a win-win-win. Yeah. If you if you ask me. Wow, this podcast just got better when when you came on. So thank you and Macklin. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, we we said it right off the bat. We're only using Macklin to get to you. That's it. Yes, that's what they yeah. said. That, that's usually how it happens. So. Yeah. Well, listen, we we need to get you on, Diana. Just you know, while we have you here, because the women's division and impact is the best in the world. We need to talk about that. It needs to be talked about. So that's that's all I have to say. Absolutely. You let me know when, and I will be here. Awesome. You'll hear from Lou soon enough. Okay. Awesome. I put you okay. on enough. <laughs> thank you guys so much. And all, well, thank for, you guys. For everybody at home, the podcast is over. We're going to say our goodbyes off the air. Steve Macklin, thank you so much, champ, for hanging out with us for a few minutes. And uh, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Wrestling Perspective. Subscribe. Do all that other bullshit. Good night. <laughs>